Welcome to Nature Insight. Speed dating with the future. I'm Britt Garner. I'm a science communicator and PhD student in interdisciplinary studies. And I'm Rob Spall, the head of communications at IPBIS, the world biodiversity platform for science and policy. Everyone you're going to hear from on this podcast is a member of IPBIS's wider community. And they all share a deep commitment to understanding the relationship between species and between humans and our Earth. Rob, as you know, we take turns every week to interview these fascinating individuals. So this week, you're actually going to hear me in conversation with Dr. David Obura. We've been talking about coral reefs and the coastal zones of the Indian Ocean in particular. David is based in Kenya, and I'm from Florida. We both grew up with an absolutely instilled love of the ocean. I can imagine that it was a great conversation, Britt, because I know some of your passions closely intersect with the work that David's been doing. I've really been looking forward to hearing this interview because David's expertise crosses so many important fields. He really brings together the climate change and the nature loss threads, and then he combines them with how this all impacts us and our lives. Well, you know what's interesting, Rob, is that David really wanted to tell me about how he's prioritized listening, listening to the people he's working with, listening to the people who live in these coastal areas. He works really inclusively with the local fishermen in these coastal zones, learning from their knowledge and letting that knowledge be used for global impact and global policy consideration. This conversation made me reflect on the really thoughtful and careful attention we gave to listen and the connection we've heard to listening from our guests so far. It reminds me of the episode we had with Professor Kai Chan and the priority he gave to listening as part of a collaborative process, particularly in achieving transformative change. Absolutely, Britt. I really think it's becoming a theme in our conversations on the podcast. If you remember in the very first episode when I was interviewing Peter Dajak, he talked about listening to local communities as a way of providing early warning systems about new emerging pandemics. And it was also an essential part of your conversation in our second episode with Dr. Anne Polina, the traditional leader in Western Australia who spoke about listening to the natural world and in particular listening to the river in her area and honoring it as a living being. Yeah, and I love how listening is a part of what we get to do with creating and producing a podcast, getting to share stories that others may listen to. And I think this is a good moment to do exactly that. Um, I'd like to give our attention over to the interview I did with Dr. David Obura, who, as I said, specializes in climate resilience and adaptation, particularly within the systems of Eastern Africa. And his connection to IPBIS was that he was one of the coordinating lead authors on the global assessment within the material regarding nature's contributions to people. David and I connected through the internet and we made our own digital recordings. As you know, within quarantine, we've all completely become professional uh, studio artists, <laughs> as I'm sure you're aware. <laughs> and he was kind enough to, to go outside his house in Mombasa, Kenya, and he actually made a recording of the cicadas outside that he wanted to share with us. I know for me, Rob, the sound just absolutely takes me there. It does for me as well, Britt. In fact, that's a sound I, I associate very closely with my own time growing up in South Africa. The cicadas were always a part of our soundscape. And there's also a great bridge from the sound of the cicadas to your part of the world. I believe 2020 is the year they're predicting countless millions of cicadas are expected to emerge from 17 years of living underground. So I guess uh, in many ways, 2020 is a year in which nature's making itself heard and felt in every corner of the world. This is the sound of our monsoon wind, the southeast monsoon that blows really strongly this time of year, and the cicadas at night. But I'll have to go inside to get away from the background noise. Hi, David. Thanks so much for joining. Hi, Rick. Pleasure to be here. You and I share a love of the ocean, and I think that that love goes back a very, very long way. Um, you grew up in Kenya and spent hours outside and around the water. How have those spaces changed in your lifetime? 
You're right. I grew up coming to the coast in Mombasa here in Kenya since I was a kid. And the coastlines have become much more populated. There's so many more people. There's a lot more fishermen. You can see the buildings where there were never buildings before and really expansive neighborhoods and towns spreading out. So you can see the footprints of people on land. And then in the sea, you know, we can see the, the decline in reef health. My youth and childhood was spent in Florida. That's that's home for me. And, you know, when I thought about could you have one superpower for me, it was always being able to breathe underwater because I'd rather not come back up. I want to hang out here for a few days. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you when I learned to scuba dive too. So I, I was in Canada, in fact, on the West Coast, and we learned to dive where there were sea lions. And so we'd see them underwater. And, and one time, I think this really perhaps set me on my course, but one night I dreamt that I, w I went out and started swimming with the sea lions without any scuba gear. And the other thing, I mean, my dream has always been to fly as well. And of course, that's quite difficult to do. But swimming and scuba diving, staying underwater and snorkeling is a lot like flying through the water. I've always loved that. You know, you actually have a Florida connection too, right? You did your PhD in Miami, Florida, but then you actually decided to take your work back. What drove that decision to study abroad, but then use those tools back home? I was 17 when I left Kenya to go finish high school in Canada, and then I did my college in Boston, and then I went to Miami for my PhD. But all through that time, I knew I would go back home. I never wanted to stay away because I didn't want to study something in the U.S. or abroad and then find that I couldn't apply those skills back home in Kenya. I love that you always had in mind that it was going to start locally for you. I mean, I think it really takes understanding uh, local context very well to really understand ecology and how ecosystems work, how people interact with the environment that they're in and the values that they perceive. And as scientists, we're often very remote from that. We study things at our universities, we go to the field for short periods of time, and we write our reports, and then a lot of decisions get made on the basis of those publications. And they can be very uh, dry and separated from reality. During my PhD in the first 10 or 15 years of my career, you know, when I was in the field, I was in the field for three or four hours at a time. And that was fantastic for really getting to know the reefs and how they work. And also spending some of that time with fishermen too. One of the first projects that I had was set up around doing participatory monitoring and mapping to go with them on their canoes. And I would sit and listen to what they were talking about and what they were doing. And I asked them where they were fishing and why and document their knowledge rather than preaching about our knowledge as scientists. And I love how that mirrors the idea of an ecosystem within knowledge or within scientific fields. Within ecosystems, we don't necessarily just see top down or bottom up. We see interactions at every level and that's what's happening with the humans in these systems as well. Yes, you know, I'm very much an ecologist at heart and I spent my PhD studying corals and coming back to Kenya after that, I felt that there wasn't a people dynamic. I didn't have a people dynamic in my work. And I felt it was just important not to study things, to preach about them, but just to listen to other people's perspectives and how they see their world, because that's, that's just as important as mine. Why, why should my perspective be more important than somebody else's? And if we don't listen to each other in that way to then come to some sort of joint solution, we won't really work out the profound issues that we have to work through. Just in case someone might be a terrestrial scientist out there or just maybe not know that much about coral reefs, can you tell us briefly why coral reefs and coastal zones are so important both for their own sake and for humans? Coral reefs are one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on the planet. They're very important for species richness and biodiversity. Because they fringe the coastlines, coastlines are very sensitive places. That's basically where the land, the sea, and the air come together. And the ecosystems that fringe the coastline live in a very narrow band that's very sensitive to changes. You know, if the sea level goes up or down one meter or two meters or five meters, some of those shallow marine ecosystems or the terrestrial ecosystems right at the fringe, they have to move because their environment is transformed completely. Now with people, we are attracted to coastlines because of the various values that they have and the things that they offer us. 
also coastlines are, you know, this fourth dimension of, of humanity and and this vast global population now is really focusing around and concentrating around coastlines. Now, coral reefs are perhaps one of the most sensitive of those coastal ecosystems, and they are very attractive to us. They're beautiful, so we really respond to them. They appeal to our imagination. So psychologically as well for people, coral reefs are very valuable because of what they show us, of the changes that are happening, not just in the coastal zone, but to the whole planet as well. They're a real canary in the coal mine for all of the things that are happening around the world now. And one of the biggest tools for coral reefs and for ocean areas in general, if you were to ask somebody, they would probably say, oh, well, marine reserves or marine protected areas. What are some of the pros and cons of something like a marine protected area? We can only change a system so much before it tips over the edge, before it goes out of balance. So whether we're extracting fish or pouring pollution into the water, we can only do so much. We have to keep certain parts of nature in an intact state. Otherwise, the systems degrade and they change completely. What marine protected areas do is they try and maintain certain spaces as pristine as possible, uh, as unimpacted as possible. One, because it's, it's good to do that for many different ethical reasons, but also the things that we use outside of those marine protected areas, the fish that we catch or the benefits we get from recreation, other things, they depend on the functioning systems within the protected areas to remain intact and provide the services that we use. This reminds me of one of the great battles of outlook and practice in the field of wildlife biology in North America, which is this idea of preservation versus conservation. Preservation, which is minimizing human input completely, setting aside spaces and, and having them not disturbed, whereas conservation had more to do with adapting and understanding how to sustainably have human interaction. I'm curious what you think about those two things, because I heard you mention the idea of minimizing human contact, but also I know that you're passionate about understanding how the human component is a piece of this. So that debate has been very live in Africa as well. We have to go quite far back to the origins of protection and conservation and from colonial times, the philosophy was very much about keeping people out. But as we have moved forward, it's increasingly clear that there's almost no real scope for pure preservation anymore. The planet has already changed so much. Things are, will never be the way they were. So now I think the debate and the focus is really around conservation. And conservation doesn't mean no development, no income, no wealth being generated. It really means understanding how natural systems are capital and they provide us with services, you know, nature's contributions to people. We have to conserve the ability of natural systems to provide those things. And I was quite aware of this growing up. For a few years, I went to a school that was about two or three hours drive outside of Nairobi through the Great Rift Valley. And at that time, the floor of the Rift Valley was, you know, completely empty. There was a road snaking through it and there was very little human footprint that you could see. But even in a few years and five years later, then as a teenager going along that same drive, you could see our footprint increasing. I knew that the time for strict preservation and keeping things away from people, even this was the, the 80s, the time was gone in Africa already at that point that we really have to focus around sustainability. It's how to integrate people with nature, do as little damage as we possibly can while we're going about our business. And a lot of that is demonstrated in locally managed marine areas and these community managed areas. And I know that that's something that you work on and are passionate about. Can you tell us a little bit about the success of some of these initiatives? Yes, so locally managed marine areas are perhaps the only real future of conservation in many parts of coastal East Africa, for example. What really needs to happen is that the fishing communities need to be established as, as stewards of the environment, of the reefs and the mangrove systems that they are the primary beneficiaries of. So, of course, they have the greatest stake in the health of that system. And so in Kenya, there's been growing interest in the establishment of locally managed marine areas. 
One thing we have realized working in community conservation in Africa in the last 20 years or so is that people learn much better from their peers. People are very interested in hearing about the experiences of others like them and what has worked and what hasn't. And we can preach as scientists about the benefits of protected areas and locally managed marine areas as much as we like. But it's really much more effective to find successful examples and to bring people together to talk about those examples. So we've had a very positive response in the fishing communities here. There has been a locally managed marine area set up about 15 years ago called Kuruwitu. And I'd like to play you a short extract from recordings that we've made about the development of locally managed marine areas like this. You'll hear the voices of Dixon Juma and Jane Sofa from this LMMA in Kuruwitu. And then you'll hear from Abdallah Loita in Djibouti, some Djiboutian fishermen that we were able to bring in a project to Kenya to look at this locally managed marine area and to learn for themselves and see if they would want to set one up themselves. We are the pioneers. We, uh, this is one of the benefits because of our, we are in the group of conserving to make the environment healthy. The coral uh, improve. Uh, the number of fish increases because the corals are act as the breeding areas for the fish. I hope to organize ourselves to keep the sea for good health. Also, we can feed us or for our future generation. So that last voice we heard was Abdallah Loita in Djibouti, and he was mentioning the idea of oceans and ocean health and feeding the community. He also mentioned future generations. Can you talk a little bit about how the future generations piece of this is related to the ocean health and food security? Food security from coral reefs and oceans is one of the key issues around the planet. And the key thing is with services like fish production is that they're very dependent on the health of the system. And if you don't manage the system well, if you allow it to decline, if you overfish or if you pollute the waters, you really undermine the future generations. It's as simple as that. We are simultaneously trying to reduce human impact, and yet some of our approaches are very much so based on human innovation and human intervention. Some of these I, I find so fascinating. The idea of putting in synthetic substrates for reef building, also the idea of moving corals around to increase genetic diversity. In your area of the world, what kind of synthetic approaches, if we call it that, what examples of those are there? So the efforts that there are now in coral in general around the world in reef restoration is really ramping up now, and especially in places where things are already heavily degraded. So for example, your home state from Florida, the Florida Keys and the reef systems in South Florida are so heavily impacted by construction and developments in the Keys that there's very little of the original natural system left and most of the major reef building corals have declined so much that they're not really building reefs anymore. And there's a huge amount of investment in restoration techniques, in breeding corals, in trying to genetically modify, really, corals to be stronger, to be able to resist higher temperatures and survive the onslaught that we're putting on them. Really, at the moment, we don't have restoration practices that can restore a reef, restore the function of a reef. You know, if, if you have a community that is losing its fisheries, we can't yet go out and replant corals and restore that reef to function that way. But if you're a tourist resort and you have tourists going in the water, you can actually restore small areas to be more attractive. And people increasingly are wanting to go out and do something too. Many divers will actually dive more or, or pay more to go out and do some dives where they're helping restore a reef system as well. So what we do fully understand as well is that in 20 or 30 years time, once we're further into the Anthropocene and temperatures are warmer, reefs will have declined further. It's unavoidable at this point. If we do do the Paris Agreement and do everything right with carbon dioxide and reducing emissions, we'll really want to have restoration practices in place at that point to be able to restore corals now in places where the climate is gradually improving and the corals are more adapted to those conditions. Of course, it won't be the same as it was before, but it would be a new normal. It'll be a, a new natural that we will have to try and create that is the best it can be 
I love the idea of a new normal because so many times with restoration projects, it becomes impossible to answer restore to when or restore to what. The fact of the matter is, even if you perfectly restored a system to the way that it was in 1925, say, <laughs> the air itself, the water itself is molecularly different than it was. The, the amounts of different gases, the interchange between these systems, it is simply different. Absolutely right with that. We really have to accept that we have transformed the planet so much that we can't go back. I, I always use the analogy of Europe, for example. Europe is a continent that is nowhere close to the natural state it was in 12 or 15,000 years ago. It just isn't. But many parts of it are in a very nice state, and people want to go there, and there's nice villages and rural places. But it's a new normal. It's not the way Europe used to be. So we really do have to look forward. And one of the big questions that we're trying to address now is, what is a safe corridor to a good future state? Which means that we don't tip over the edge of a, of a hot planet, you know, or a sour planet, or all these things that could go wrong. Absolutely. And so much of that, that future thinking is certainly reflected in the kinds of goals and the kinds of policies being implemented or at least being looked at by organizations like the United Nations. It's so interesting to me to think about oceans in this context of something like the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals because oceans make up the majority of the planet and yet only one of those 17 goals are focused on it. You actually had a recent publication where you described the goal 14, the one about life below water, through the lens of all of the other SDGs. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The way you put that is, is very interesting. People have a very terrestrial focus. So getting a sustainable development goal for the oceans was actually quite a, you know, a success or a victory. And it really came about because of the interests and the lobbying of the small island developing states who uh, big ocean states as opposed to being small island states. But the thing is about the sustainable development goals is that you can't just focus on one. They're an indivisible whole. And the key thing about the oceans is really to realize that food security, alleviating poverty, improving rights and equality amongst people, gender equality in amongst countries. The ocean has a part to play in all of those. You can't hive off one of the goals separate from the others. And so what I tried to do in that publication is to really show that what do all the other goals look like through the ocean lens? And I know coral reefs, so I did it from the perspective of, of a coral reef initially. And I think because the sustainable development goals are indivisible, it really gives us a chance to align all of our efforts, whether you're a fisherman in Kenya or a farmer in India or you know, working in a tech company in Silicon Valley. If you agree to the sustainable development goals, if you think that philosophy is right, you can really align your interests and each, each person can do their part and gain from the better whole that, that we can create. I know in, in the same paper, one thing I loved was a table you had that was sort of describing the interactions between coral reefs, the sustainable development goals, and human well-being and how these could interact and have positive, neutral, or negative effects, just like within an ecosystem. What are some examples of changes or scenarios where the result is mutually beneficial? There are lots of good scenarios where results are mutually beneficial. So for example, the initial work that I was doing with fishermen going out on their canoes to try and understand how they perceive their space on a reef the area that I did that was one with the biggest sort of tourism resort development in Kenya as well. And there was a lot of conflict between tourism interests and fisheries interests. But I felt that they didn't need to be. All there needed to be was a mutual alignment of goals. The fishermen need to get fish to eat and send their kids to school. The tourism developments need uh, reefs for scuba diving and also for the protection that the reef provides to the coastline. And if they could only realize that and align their interests together, they could come to mutually beneficial agreements about what to do, where to protect fish, to keep them in the water for tourists, but also to produce the next generation of fish that can be caught elsewhere. So I think there's, there's a lot of win-wins like that. If only people take the broader and the longer term perspective, 
When you think of speed dating with the future of, of coral reefs, what are those first things that grab you or catch your mind? Are they feelings of optimism? Is it pessimism? You know, I'd have to say my perspective now is really one of just realism because th there's no point in being optimistic without understanding that we're going to lose a lot of coral reefs. There's, there's no question about that. There's also no point in being pessimistic because if we do that, we'll lose all coral reefs. And I think the key thing is realizing that it's all about people. As much as, you know, we value nature and biodiversity should not decline, we have all these people on our planet and we have to look at people's interests and get those interests to align. Of course, our role as scientists and policymakers and others is to be realistic about things, to say, well, no, you can't catch all the fish, even though you may want to, because then there'll be nothing left for you tomorrow. For those individuals listening to this, what could you say are some daily actions to contribute to a happier and healthier new normal when it comes to coral reefs? One is, is do no harm to any other capital or to somebody else's interests. To most people, it is also our footprint is too large for the planet. So we have to reduce. And you do that because you, you, you love it. You don't save something if you don't love it. So we, we have to really understand what our planet is about and nature and our relationship inside it. And on the basis of that, then make those you know, decisions to, to have a smaller footprint. And how wonderful that both you and I got to know the oceans to then love them yes. and uh, lead us to our future work. Yes, exactly. I feel very fortunate to have been able to do what I do and to be in the ocean as I have been. David, thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Pleasure to do this. Thanks, Brut. That was a really great interview. Our podcast is called Nature Insight, and I loved the fact that listening to that interview actually gave me an insight that I hadn't thought about before. As a communicator, I've often used the idea of knowledge as an ecosystem, an ecosystem of knowledge. But to hear David talk about it as an actual tangible ecosystem, it goes beyond the metaphor. And, and David's perspectives, I think, have really helped me to think about the connections between different kinds of knowledge, almost in a physical way. Oh, certainly. I mean, we are past the point of metaphor when we, when we think about knowledge being shared as a resource. As soon as you understand that, even within the 21st century for humans, data being the commodity, being the resource, um, knowledge is data. And so if that is the food, if you will, um, the passage of that through systems and through trophic levels or, you know, the food chain, the food web, is very real and, and very much so more physical than it is metaphorical. And also the, the, the way in which if you're thinking about knowledge as a, as a really as a physical ecosystem, that knowledge about one part of our world or one part of life, say nature or biodiversity, has an absolutely indivisible connection to all of the other parts of knowledge, whether it's about health or social security or welfare or uh, well-being. And, and the idea that if you're going to treat knowledge as a true physical ecosystem, you need to treat all of the different parts of that ecosystem with similar levels of urgency and priority. Yes, and I think one of the things that draws certainly myself and I believe David as well to the ocean is the fact that the changes that happen there are absolutely changes that are happening to the whole planet, that it is so intricately woven into every process on the earth, the hydrosphere, the, the part of our planet that is water, particularly the ocean. You cannot separate it from all of the other things that happen. And in fact, I mean, I think almost all of us would instinctively understand the connection between oceans, fisheries, and food security. But to think about the value of our coastal areas and of oceans and, and of corals as this reflection of what's happening to the whole planet, particularly in the context of climate change, it's, it's a really great way of uh, giving a different level of value to oceans. You know, David used the phrase, which I think most of us have heard or used, this idea of a canary in the coal mine. But to me, the canary in the coal mine metaphor has never really had a great deal of resonance. It, it, it's always seemed like it was an image from an earlier era. I wonder if 50 years from now, the phrase, like a reef in the ocean, might take on similarly ominous connotations. I mean, I certainly hope not, but I do understand what you mean. It is an absolute truth that the reefs are changing. And that change, if it continues unmitigated, will absolutely be a kind of tell and forecast for the way that things are going generally. Mm -hmm.
That's it for this episode of Nature Insight, Speed Dating with the Future. I'm Britt Garner. And I'm Rob Spall. In our next episode, we're flipping the coin and having a look at nature from a different perspective. I'll be speaking with Marie-Claire DeVoe, Caring's Chief Sustainability Officer. Caring is a global luxury group which manages huge brands like Gucci, Saint Laurent, Alexander McQueen, and many more. We'll be talking about the role of businesses in conservation and the restoration of biodiversity, as well as the value of nature to the private sector. So be sure to subscribe to the show and leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to learn more about conservation and the work that IPBIS is doing, go to www.ipbis.net or find them on their social media channels. Just search for at IPBIS, that's at I-P-B-E-S. Thanks for listening.